Today's uh, invited lecture series has a couple of representatives from Apple with us today to talk about <laughs> <laughs> talk about some of the security features in the new Mac OS and uh, and other things. I'm sure. So uh, we're already running, I'm already running late. Why don't we jump right into it? We have Sean and John, which is which? Sean Geddes. Sean Geddes and John Hurley, and I'll let them just go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks for inviting us here. Always love to talk about this stuff. Uh, I chose a naval motif there for the slides. <laughs> for you guys. Um, so we'll uh, talk mostly about security features, but since uh, some people may not be that familiar with uh, OS 10 in general and, and Macintosh, uh, we'll kind of rush through that. I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions and whatever. And, and also for the things that Sean's going to tell you about. Um, so OS 10 is the, that's our main operating system right now. We've, uh, uh, we've of course shipped OS 9 based systems for quite a long time, but OS 10 got released uh, last March. Um, it's based on uh, BSD Unix and Mach, so those are kind of down at the the lower levels. Um, it has this great uh, graphical user interface and it's, it's available now. Um, one thing I always like to, uh, to tell people, uh, actually just seeing Paul's office reminded me of it again, uh, a lot of places are set up where they have uh, a Unix box and a Windows box and um, they do a lot of their you know, scientific work or whatever on the Unix box and then they do their memos and Word uh, on the Windows box. Well, you can toss both of them out the window, replace them with one Mac, and do all the Unix stuff on the, the Unix layer underneath, and then still uh, run your, uh, well, your PowerPoint presentation or uh, write your memos in Word uh, on the Mac. So I think it seems like it's kind of early for a demo, but I just pop, pop right in uh, to this because I thought it was important. First of all, this um, PowerPoint that you're seeing is, is um, the new version of Office uh, from Microsoft for 10. So it's running natively on 10. It's not running through Classic. Um, and let me just hide that. I wanted to show this. So if you're used to, to Unix, you're a little uncomfortable with this Mac, you know, touchy-feely graphics kind of thing, and you get worried, just run terminal. Oops. Come back here, terminal. Hit this little green button to maximize the window, and now you should feel okay. Okay, everything. <laughs> you know, you can type in LS, you can do uh, whatever. So it's okay. That's just to show you. It's really Unix underneath. Um, you, you know, we do use uh, certainly in engineering we use Unix a lot. To, it's more convenient for certain things. Uh, than the finder is. Um, but it's really important to note that that's the base, and there's a lot of code that we've already seen ported over from Unix. People say, hey, this should port right over, and they try it out, and it, and it actually does. Uh, as we were telling some people earlier, um, you know, we have the GCC compiler. Uh, it's got uh, it's 295, I think, and some, some nice C++ features and whatever. So anyway, that stuff's all there. Um, let me hide that and pop back into PowerPoint. <coughs> Oops, sorry, wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can see multi Message, multitasking in action as it launches Excel instead. No, we don't want Excel. Come back here to PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, so back to back to our slides here. So Apple is in a really interesting and unique position um, in the security space because we make 
everything from the ground up. So we make the hardware boxes, we uh, write the, the firmware ourselves, and the operating system as well. So we, there are certain security things that you can only do if you can re really um, control all of those uh, different layers. Um, we have some additional advantages uh, in security, particularly for, for OS X. Um, for us at Apple, it's a, it's a fresh start. It's a chance to um, not have to worry about a lot of the things that have kind of accumulated over 15 years of, of Mac OS development. So it's, OS X is very, very different than OS IX. Um, it does, there is a classic <coughs> environment that's kind of a, a virtual machine that runs uh, just another process uh, that OS 9 uh, runs as inside 10. Um, but we were able to make a lot of architecture changes uh, in this new OS. Um, the, one of the key parts of it is the basis is this uh, thing called, that we call Darwin, which is the BSD and mock kernel. And that is all open source. So that's available. Uh, there's a website kind of at the end of this presentation you can look at. Uh, but if you want to see how any of this stuff is, is going, if you want to compile your own kernel, great. You can go get the sources and pull all that stuff down and compile it. Um, in addition, a lot of the higher level or medium level uh, security stuff is actually also open source. We, we got that uh, open source, I think, in, in May. So if you want to see how we do cryptography, if you want to look into our CDSA or whatever. That stuff is all there and it's available. And we get a lot of play from external developers. You know, They can say, gee, I wonder how they do that. Or um, here's this patch I just applied on the Linux side. Um, let's send it over to, uh, to Darwin and apply it to the Apple side too. So we get some really good leverage from them. OK, so let's put all those up at once. Um, some of the, the uh, design goals that we have, and, and actually I should maybe go all the way back to the beginning of the slide uh, to introduce myself and sort of what I do at Apple. I'm the manager of data security, so I, um, on the engineering side, I um, manage the group that designs and implements most of the security features on OS X. Um, so we certainly advise on all of them. We don't necessarily do all of them. For example, like the networking guys in CoreOS, they're going to do things like SSL or whatever. But when they have crypto questions, they're going to come to us. Um, so anyway, our design goals for OS X are to make it configurable and easy to use because our, our biggest customer base is really you know, home users. They, they're not sophisticated at all. Um, we can't do some things that you might want to do in a more secure environment where you show, you know, a warning dialogue or whatever. Uh, people like my mom, whatever, they get a dialogue that says, oh my gosh, something bad happened. They're just going to call. They're going to pick up the phone and say, what is going on on my machine? And that costs us money. So we don't want that to happen. Um, it's just, and it's confusing for them too. They don't really know what the right thing to do. They usually hit OK or whatever. So we try to design it so that as best as possible we can sort of make those decisions for them. But we'd like to make it configurable so that uh, places that are much more interested in, in security and need it uh, are able to take that same OS out of the box, configure some things, and then they're all set. Um, we try to use standards whenever possible uh, just because uh, that's you know, people are used to that. They, uh, the community at large, has spent a lot of time investing in these standards. They've thought out some of the, um, you know, pitfalls or whatever. Standards aren't always maybe the best, absolute best that we could come up with. But Apple has learned over the years to, um, you know, go standards as much as possible. Um, like particularly in the crypto area, nobody wants to hear about, you know, a crypto algorithm that I just cooked up. <coughs> Uh, doesn't matter how good it is, whatever, it doesn't have, you know, 20 years of testing or uh, whatever. So, you know, we, we have standard crypto algorithms like uh, AES, uh, things like that. And, of course, 
one other design goal. We want to make it secure. So that's that's a very important thing. Um, here's a really rough outline of some of the security components that are in the uh, OS X uh, operating system. At the bottom level, open firmware. That's that's kind of the BIOS that um, you know knows how to boot up the machine, knows which kernel to load, things like that. And I'll tell you about what security features we have there. Um, the next le the first software level really is the Darwin layer. It has BSD kernel and the mock kernel in there. Um, and then above that, there are just a few, there are a lot more security components actually, but I only drew a few on there. Um, authorization, uh, keychain, and CDSA is uh, common data security architecture. And that's kind of a big framework for a lot of the security uh, features that we've had. Um, at the Darwin layer, you're really, it's very, very similar to Unix security, okay? It's, uh, user level security. Um, the root user has power to do anything on the machine. Uh, we're working on improving the granularity of that, but right now that's that's the way it sits. Um, so we are educating developers that you know they should try and think about exactly what they might need the root user for because if they if they just make their application um, set UID root, that's really asking for too much. So. We're trying to educate them in that direction. Uh, same kind of privileges at the file system layer, so users and groups. Um, we have protected memory. That's a big, big change from OS 9. Um, in some sense, we, we could only go so far on OS 9, and then you'd have to say, well, this process can always look into the memory space for that process. So it's very, very hard to, to keep real security going there. Um, we use mock IPC for doing secure messaging back and forth between processes. And important thing to note is that it's not capabilities based. So it really is just this root user and versus everybody else kind of setup. Um, CDSA is a acronym for Common Data Security Architecture. It was originally a standard that uh, Intel proposed and is now an open group standard. Um, and this is, if you're familiar with the, uh, the crypto API on Microsoft um, side, it's, it's a little bit similar to that. But the crypto API really is only the, the CSP portion of that. So it's really only the crypto cryptography portion of it, whereas um, CDSA also deals with certificates and trust management. Um, and actually data storage uh, because if you're se se uh, storing secure pieces of information you want to couple that in with the cryptography piece. Um, the keychain is kind of like one of our highest level pieces and um, that's a lot of people even at Apple just think of us as those keychain guys. You know, they don't know, it's just really the tip of the iceberg. I mean there's tons of stuff underneath to support this keychain functionality. Uh, keychain stores your, uh, stores passwords. It's really a mechanism for doing legacy-based um, password storage and, and retrieval. And uh, every user on OS 10 has a keychain. It was an optional feature on OS 9. Um, but we're encouraging all our developers to, if they have passwords, store them in the keychain. We spent a lot of time trying to make that a secure place for um, keeping track of your passwords. Um, by default, it's unlocked when you log into OS 10. It uses that same password to unlock your login keychain. And so those passwords will be available to other applications on the system. Um, they, it is protected. Not any application can just go and grab a password without warning. So you can set up an access control list saying, you know, only this application will be able to use this password or this list of applications would be able to use it. Anybody else that tries to do it, they'll get a dialog saying, hey, this application is trying to, to use it. So you can't really get some virus or whatever just saying, okay, give me all your passwords. Uh, let's see. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the authorization API to, to point out one of the areas where we're trying to make things more granular. Um, we, 
we're trying very hard to modularize the security decisions that we have in OS 10. Um, we can't, you know, we can't have a hundred percent secure system out of the box. Well, probably never. But even, you know, every release is going to require that we do incremental stuff. Um, but we, what we'd like to do is, as we do one of those blocks, make it as as good as we possibly uh, can. So what the the authorization API is um, to help us make things more granular. So there's not this root user versus uh, a regular user. We're trying to get applications to ask for which privileges they actually need to do certain operations. And one of the key distinction, distinctions that we've made is distinct, uh, distinguishing between authorization and authentication. People tend to lump them together because usually to, to uh, obtain an authorization, you usually are required to authenticate yourself. And so people blur that line and mush them together. But we found out that that's not what you always want to do. You don't get them uh, as much flexibility as you need. So authorization is really a yes-no question. Am I allowed to erase this hard drive? Am I allowed to mount this CD? Am I allowed to log in? Um, that those are all things that are actually just return a yes-no answer. Um, now, they might have some sideband information that you need to actually do the operation. Or, as a side effect, they may require you to prove your identity in some way, to know that you are an admin user or, or whatever. Um, the authentication step there that may be part of the, the permission you need uh, might establish your identity. So it might be able to, might be a fingerprint that could tie in with an actual person. It could be just something you know, like a password, the username and a password. Um, who you are, what you know, and what you have. Those are three different things. So like actual physical things, biometrics, um, things that you know like passwords, or um, things that you have like a smart <coughs> card or some kind of token uh, that you can actually supply. Um, the authentication step could succeed trivially. You could just say, you know, um, are you this person, just come back and say yes. So you might not have any user interaction uh, required to actually complete that authentication step. Um, there are some examples that just, again, to call it the difference between authorization and authentication. Um, the last two on authorization, logging in at the console or logging in remote, remotely, you can easily see that there might be different requirements for that. Um, and different privileges that, that could be um, awarded to you as a result of succeeding in either one of those. So it's, it's a good thing to be able to call those out. Okay, so as I mentioned, um, security really is an iterative process both for um, sites implementing security and, and companies implementing security. Um, we need to do it a step at a time. We, we do try and do, do our best. Um, a lot of times there's a, there is a trade-off between usability and security. So you, uh, something might be more secure, but it's more of a pain in the neck to use. I mean, you have to keep typing your password or inserting a smart card or whatever. Um, as much as possible, we are trying to make it more usable and more secure. So that, that is possible at times uh, by, uh, for example, caching information. Like if you know if we have developers using this authorization API, since it's funneling through a single bottleneck, we can do things, or the administrator can configure things, saying um, like, well, gee, you just authenticated two minutes ago. So even though you're asking for a totally different right, we can check and make sure that you're still uh, still okay and not have to bother you with the password. Because if security is too obtrusive, people just try to get around it. So um, in a lot of cases, if you make it easier, you can also make it more secure too. 
Okay, so here are some of the different layers that, um, let's say you're trying to secure a system, an OS X system. Um, I'm going to go through some different examples of things that you can use or turn on in OS X to, to make a system more secure. Uh, first one really is physical security. Open firmware is, is the BIOS layer. The BSD or kernel layer. And then uh, framework and user level. Um, so there's, there are different security things at each, each level there. Um, in terms of physical security for, for desktops, um, you want to actually lock the case. The cases are set up so you can put a padlock through it. Um, if nothing else, it prevents uh, you know, people from stealing the memory out, out of the inside. But the real important thing from a security standpoint is that there is an application that allows you to turn on um, security and open firmware that prevents um, uh, non-admin users from booting into another operating system. And that becomes really important if you think about it because we didn't know about all this security stuff on OS 9. It's not implemented there. Um, or if you boot into some other OS, we can't necessarily make all this stuff come into play if you're allowed to boot into some, some other OS. So using that app, which I'll describe in, in a minute, you can lock that down. The way that, let's say, you forget the password for this open firmware, the way that we've implemented it, uh, you can reset that password by changing the physical memory configuration in the machine. So it kind of proves that you have physical access to the inside of the machine. Uh, but it also means that you want to lock that machine so that people can't just change that password. Um, for PowerBooks and iBooks and iPods, bring out the iPod because people probably haven't seen <coughs> those. This, this is a new iPod. We just released it uh, a few weeks ago, something like that. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about what you'd use that for. Those, those are eminently stealable, right? So um, setting this open firmware password is not going to help you at all because you can just go crack the case and change the memory and you're, you're away. So what you pretty much have to do is, okay, A, prevent it from being stolen, but if it is, your data better be encrypted uh, on there because no matter what kind of other things that you do, uh, an attacker can always open up that box, take out the hard drive, and start uh, grabbing your data off of it. Okay, so open firmware security. Um, there's an application called Open Firmware Password uh, app that's on the installation CD and I think the utilities folder. Uh, it's not installed by default because it's kind of considered an admin tool type thing. But it prevents basically all these hotkeys that you might be familiar with. Uh, it prevents those from, from working. And uh, the end goal is to prevent it, an unauthorized user from changing um, your boot device or being able to you know, boot past your, uh, your version of the OS. Um, uh, single user mode, I mean, that's a really common thing on, on Unix, right? You boot uh, uh, on this machine, you can hold down the S key, you're going to go into single user mode, you can create a root account. So as you know, in, in Unix terms, that's the end. I and mean, once you have a root account, you can do all kinds of stuff. Um, so this, is, this app's really important to use. Um, it, it, it's a superset of IEEE 1275. Um, it's, it's an equivalent to, there is a, an open firmware command you can type in. So you could just boot it to open firmware and type that in. Um, at the BSD layer, um, one of the really good things about um, OS 10, if you just think about it as a, as a Unix platform, is that as we ship it out of the box, almost all the services are turned off. So as like an administrator installing a bunch of machines, you don't have to worry that if somebody just installs it, they're going to suddenly open, open themselves up by exposing all these services. Um, so like FTP is turned off and Telnet and, and all these things. Um, you know, sure, you can turn them back on, but at least the naive user isn't going to just suddenly be broadcasting all these services. 
Um, the root password is also turned, turned off by default, so um, you can't just type SU and, and you know, have a root account. Um, the file permissions area may be a little bit different from what you're used to on Unix. Uh, most of the decisions there revolve around making it work nicely with OS 9. So it's not, it's not exactly like, you know, say, a Red Hat Linux box. You find it mostly similar, but and in places where it differs, it is to support um, just OS 9 working right. Um, almost anything you know about security on Unix is also going to apply pretty closely uh, to, to Mac OS X. Um, you can run a lot of the same type of tools. Um, you know, you can take command line tools and recompile them and run them on X. Um, you can take, there are a lot of things on the web for looking at vulnerabilities of um, Unix systems. They're also going to run on X. Usually the ones that I've taken over and tried, they just report um, no holes, pretty much. I mean, there's, uh, just because we have so much, many things turned off. Um, but they, they are interesting, interesting to run. Um, let's see what else. <coughs> Some of the, the higher level configuration changes that you can make and should make to, to your OS 10 box. Um, by default, auto login is turned on, so you boot up the machine, it logs you in as, you know, whatever user you set up with, uh, set up the machine with. Uh, that's kind of an obvious one, but it's worth doing. Um, enabling the screensaver password, it's a really easy thing to do, but that also protects your machine uh, from just people randomly coming over and being able to hop into your data. Um, if you can, it's best to set up another user that is not an administrator user on your machine. So don't get in the habit of just logging in as your, as your admin user. Um, that'll kind of prevent even yourself from making mistakes that might require you know, admin access. Um, and lastly there is um, apply software updates because we do release security patches as part of the software update process. Um, if you're not familiar with OS 9 or 10, really, the um, uh, on 9 and 10 we have this uh, app called Software Update that know, knows how to go to a server that we have and check to see if your machine needs to be updated. And it can automatically update it, update it for you. So that is that is a good thing to, to apply those changes. Um, to talk before about, about the keychain, you can have um, many, many different keychains. Um, you don't just have to have the login keychain. Um, the password can actually be longer than the, the login password. So that's that's useful sometimes. Um, there are a couple changes that you can make to your keychain to make that more secure. So you can set a timeout so that the keychain is not unlocked uh, all the time. And you can set it so that when the machine sleeps that it also locks. So your passwords aren't going to be uh, available for use until you unlock the keychain again. Um, each password that's in the keychain actually has an access control list of which uh, applications can access it. And one thing is that the, the iTools password, which you use to get to your iDisk or your Mac.com account or things like that, by default, um, that doesn't have that will allow any application to access it. So it's better to go in and change the access control list for that um, for that password. And then if you have some really sensitive passwords that you don't want to have available right after you log in, you can always put them in a second keychain. The first time an app needs to use them, it will ask you for the password for that other keychain. So you don't really have to think about it too much, but you may want to move some things in there. So protecting your data, um, actually I'll hop to the end of that slide first. On OS 9, we had an application called Apple File Security, which would kind of encrypt one file and then decrypt it. And it's, okay, it's there, but it's really um, not that great because, of course, you're, the, the file is sitting around unencrypted, and then at one point, it's sitting around on your disk. So it may be possible using some recovery tools to actually find that file. Um, on 
as of OS 10.1, we have this really, really cool feature called encrypted disk copy images. If you've ever used the disk copy application, you can create these disk images that, um, to the, uh, if you look at them in the finder, they're just a file. But if you double click them, uh, disk copy will open them, and then, then they appear to the rest of the system as a volume. And you can use them just like any other volume, just like a hard disk or a, you know, a zip disk, whatever. Copy files to them. As you copy the files to them, they're encrypted. When you are reading the data off, it's decrypted on the fly. Um, it's, it's really pretty high performance. Um, and I'll show you how I have this machine set up so that actually all my data <coughs> that's not public data, it's all automatically in this encrypted disk um, copy image. It's a really good thing. If you have portables that you're carrying around that, that might have sensitive data, it's a really, really good thing to set up uh, in this way. Does that uh, not work on OS 9? doesn't work on OS 9. So all the, yes? Well, the vulnerability, the vulnerability you mentioned a minute ago was uh, the unencrypted version still might be around in the previous OS, right? Right. And it didn't sound like that problem went away with this new encrypted volume? With, with, the, with the encrypted volume, when I, like let's say I open text edit, I take a lot of notes using that because that's, on 10 it's actually a pretty nice app. And when I save it, I save it right into the encrypted uh, disk image. Um, I actually have redirects that point like my caches into that encrypted thing. So stuff is all there. But you right. can buffer in the clear before you before you save it. In the clear somewhere. The saving is encrypted copy. It can be yes, there are still vulnerabilities. It's not okay, we don't have we do not have an encrypted swap disk. Right? So some of that stuff might be in your in your swap file on your system. Um, not perfect, but it's getting there. And it's the, one of the nice things is that it's really, really easy to use. I mean, it's one thing for, you know, not everybody is security conscious. And it's really easy, to, you know, you're just trying to do your job. You're trying to get stuff done, you're taking notes, whatever. If it's a pain in the neck, people aren't going to do it. So, uh, and in, in every organization, you know, most of the people are not dealing all the time with security, but they still could have, you know, if they're in accounting or whatever, they could have or in our case, you know, marketing. Oh my gosh, that's even more more secret in Apple than anything else. Our marketing stuff, right? They want to be able to store them. Let me ask one more question. Uh -huh. uh, when you delete a file, is the file still there, or is it actually really is it overwritten on the compilation? Um, in the encrypted disk copy, or uh, just in general? In general, no, it's not. So it's we don't have secure erase there, right? It's not going to overwrite that thing with uh, with the Gutmann scheme or the NIS scheme or whatever. So that's not there. It's uh, maybe, there might be a third party solution for that. There's several. Actually, if I could jump in, I think the question that you had asked about 9 when John talked about encrypting that individual file, remember in 9, you've got essentially the whole disk is an unencrypted image, an unencrypted volume. And you're encrypting just one file, so the file that was deleted technically was just marked as a deleted file, so it still sits there. What John was talking about here is creating that uh, encrypted image where everything is written to uh, that image. You're deleting a file, and the file is marked as deletion, but it's still on that encrypted uh, image. So it's not in the clear on the drive. It's physically in that encrypted image. But so, it's clear in the file. Or on the swap disk. Right. During it, that it could time, be during that time the swap Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're, you know, we know about those things. As I said, it's an iterative process. I want to make sure I can ship this. I'd rather make it available, uh, get stuff out there, and then, you know, as I know, as we learn about these things, then uh, try and tighten them up more. It's still, you know, a pretty useful feature. Um, here's kind of a screenshot about how to create it. If you go to new blank image in the disk copy application, all the stuff is the same, but down at the bottom here, uh, you'll see that little encryption tab for AES 128-bit encryption. Um, the only algorithm that we expose in OS 10.1 is actually AES, but 
this feature is built on top of CDSA, and so actually any algorithm that, that CDA, CDSA supports that would make sense for this kind of encryption technically could be available. And we might expose more of those uh, either at the command line tool level or maybe in, in the UI. Um, yes? Now, uh, is that stored encrypted somewhere? The key for, for the encryption? The, the encryption key for these images is a key that is derived from the password that you type in when you create it. So, you, you know, if you want to make it more secure, you should choose a pretty long key, but you can store that in your keychain. By default, it's stored in the keychain. How long is the password that uh, you use to access the key? Um, it's whatever you choose for your keychain. Oh, no, it's for the keychain. Yeah, I think it's up to 255 or something Fully like that. Um, one caveat there is that current in, in 10.1, your <coughs> Username and password can only be eight characters. But, and that's that password is the one that's used to unlock your login keychain. However, the, the first eight characters are passed off to login window. The whole field is passed off to the keychain. So you can type in, you could type in a 40 character password, the first eight, which was your login password, and then you know, the, the longer one. I would say that's a little bit of a pain in the ass to do, so I would probably you would want to make a second keychain uh, to do that so that it's not unlocked. You know, if you had a, a really secure thing that you didn't want it. But I would recommend using the keychain anyway because you you don't want to have to keep typing this password. Uh, I mean, that way you can make it make it a longer, a longer password, which will therefore generate a more secure um, key. It, it doesn't actually, it takes the password, it derives a key from that, and it uses that key to encrypt the data. Um, so a little bit more about encrypted disk, disk copy. Um, one thing you can do is if you choose a size that's convenient for doing backups, like a CD type size, then when you want to back up your secure data, you just drag the whole image onto it onto a CD and burn it. Uh, OS 10 supports supports uh, CD burn directly, so you can just pop in a blank CD and say it burn, and that's it. Um, third thing there is setting up aliases to redirect data. So you can either use Unix to uh, do symbolic links to, to redirect things. Um, you know, like my tilde library documents is redirected to go onto my security disk. Uh, and you can add that disk to your login items so that it's automatically mounted when you when you log in. That means that you're not going to forget that you need to mount that. Um, performance is good, and as I said, it's really important for PowerBooks or, or iBooks because those can disappear and you want your data to be safe. Yes? Take back that you said the uh, keychains are protected by Atlas, and the Atlas contain program names? The, the Atlas? Um, contain um, program information. It's it's a uh, signature of the application that's accessing. The digital signature of the application. Yes. Is what is in the app. Yes. For the item inside the. It's it's a per item ACL. So you can have different ACLs for each what size item. The application? Currently in 10.1, it's it's not a full digital signature, so. It's, you know, it's doing a cryptographic hash of some subset of the file. And that's really, it, that's and for... that key is what? What's that? And that key is... The key... You're doing a cryptographic hash. Yeah, that's using SHA-1 hash of some bytes in the file. Some number of bytes. So it's, it's not a perfect way of identifying which app, but it's, it's pretty good. We're working on it. Yes? Can the OS itself live on the encrypted uh, volume? Yes, you can actually, oh, sorry, no. You can, no. You can boot off like an external device, but you can encrypt everything. We don't have, we don't have a full setup for doing that. But I, I think um, 
setting the machine up very much like I have this PowerBook set up is, is a pretty good setup. So, I mean, well, in fact, if you want me to show you, maybe that will illustrate sort of how well, I, I have it. I think I understand. You just have your data in an encrypted volume, and everything else is unencrypted, right? Right. Right. So, for example, here I have one disk that's partitioned. The first partition has OS 10 that's, that's stock OS 10. Nothing else is on it, right? So, if I was an attacker, I could go to the store and buy that, and I would find all that stuff. But if I need to find out any data, they're not going to find it. You can install the application to those encrypted volumes. And yes, you could. But again, with an application itself, like the the application, if you can go buy it at the store, then why hide that? I mean, what you really want to hide is the data that that's that that's protected. Uh, yes. Can you um, change the location of your swap file so that it um, is created on an encrypted uh, image file? Maybe I haven't tried it. I know there are. There are certain things that you can't redirect to uh, an encrypted image, and I consider those bugs. So we'll be looking at those and, and figuring out ways to, you know, to make that work. Um, yeah, there are a few. Actually, before I start, that. we're looking through them. But you can, tr you know, you can always try it out. It's easy to, to just create a symbolic link or an alias and um, see what works. Um, I have a, a lot of stuff redirected. So, um, so some of the, the uh, security efforts that we're doing at Apple, um, I did pr talk pretty much about um, Darwin and open source, but that is a great advantage for us. If, um, I'll let Sean talk about that. Um, but it does let, let a better peer review of crypto code and, and security code in general. Um, and it's a little bit easier to do export compliance, although not, not a whole lot. Um, and then a lot of people are just looking at it right, so they can see if there are security holes. Um, a few of the standards that, you know, we, do, we have a lot more standards. I just put down a few. We, we have smart card support through PCSC. CDSA is crypto and, and public key infrastructure. Um, Kerberos, we have the implementation from MIT. Um, we're doing some work with NIST on, uh, they're defining some new security APIs, which we'll actually implement on top of CDSA. Um, we have a, a product security web page. Um, security, you don't hear security talk that much from Apple. Apple's really low key about it. Um, but. There is a place to go where people can report issues that they, they've found. Um, and we do work with CERT and, uh, and FIRST and FreeBSD. As you know, advisories come in, we, they go immediately out to a team of people um, in different areas. And you know, we say, OK, are we vulnerable to this? And if so, you know, how do we patch it? And how do we distribute it? Um, so we, we look at security incidents um, really quickly. Um, I will totally let Sean talk about Stas, and I wanted to do another another quick demo. Find the right thing running here. Oh, sorry. So you can't hear the sound, but the sound's going, and. I don't know, you'll see this, this go on. Um, the movie itself, you've probably seen it, it's kind of an old trailer. But the, the really interesting thing is this is playing live off the encrypted disk, disk copy image. So, and this is a, a 400 megahertz machine. If you have, uh, on faster machines, you can do full screen, uh, you know, full sound uh, video. So th the point is that that basically the performance is, is really pretty good. I mean, I don't think you'd want to do video editing on it, but almost everything else, certainly, I mean, this PowerPoint presentation is being run off the encrypted disk copy image. Um, I do save all my notes, I save my email. Um, just about anything can go on here, and it's, it's plenty fast. Can you explain the functionality of the security of the iPod TV? 